Orleans Humanist Perspective, presented by the New Orleans Secular Humanist Association, following are a few principles of humanism. We're committed to the use of science and reason for understanding the universe and for solving human problems. We're skeptical of untested claims of knowledge, but we're open to new ideas. We are concerned with securing justice and fairness in society and in ending intolerance and discrimination. We are committed to the total separation of religion and government. We affirm humanism as a realistic alternative to the theologies of despair and the ideologies of violence. We reject the concept afterlife and believe in living a full and rewarding life here and now. We value and respect each individual's right to judge and lead their lives according to their own position as long as it's respectful of other people living in a free society. We hope you enjoy today's program and others in the weeks to follow. Hello folks, thanks for being with us again. I'm Harry Greenberger, the host of the show. Recently, the New Orleans Baptist Theological Seminary um, had a meeting and the topic of this was Who Lives, Who Dies, Who Decides? A panel discussion on medical ethics. And uh, I found that a topic that would be of interest to us secular humanists. And so I invited uh, Steve Lemke, who's a professor at the seminary uh, in philosophy and ethics, uh, to come, come talk to us about what that group discussed and what, what sort of maybe what sort of conclusions you arrived at. But first, thank you for being here. And tell us something about your background. Well, thank you, Harry. You're very gracious to invite me to come. And uh, uh, I do teach philosophy and ethics, and, and bioethics is one of the areas of my particular interest. Um, I have had the opportunity through the years. I've uh, served as a pastor and a church staff member, so I've uh, reg going to hospitals regularly uh, is a part has been a part of my responsibilities. I've also uh, been a chaplain at um, uh, hospitals, both uh, small regional hospitals and mental health hospitals and major hospitals. And uh, I've also had the opportunity to be on the bioethics committees of a couple of major uh, uh, hospitals in metropolitan areas. And uh, so I, I'm very interested in the issues of, of medical ethics and uh, glad to talk about them. Very good. Now, this, this panel discussion that, that took place there, uh, were there people expressing different views about who decides and when and what and how? Were, were there variety of views expressed? There, and what position did you take and what position did some of the others take? It was an interesting discussion. I, I think that um, uh, all of the panelists came from broadly a Judeo-Christian perspective, uh, but we disagreed on, on some specifics. We dealt with very uh, specific case studies that were real uh, historical case studies and very difficult ones. Um, we had a, a, pan a panel made up of a physician, a nurse, a, an attorney, a, uh, a Catholic priest and myself as, as a Baptist. And so uh, as we dealt with those case studies, uh, we found that although we shared many beliefs in common as we dealt with the particular case studies, we sometimes differed on some of the details. When you talked about case studies, were these people who were near-death people, people who had maybe incurable situations. That generally was what you were yes, talking all, about. Yes, all three case studies uh, were dealing with um, essentially terminal patients and, and, and what to do. All right. Now, I suspect in almost every case, the family had input into the decisions. Uh, in the famous Terry Shivo case where uh, it you know, had to go to the court in this Presumably, you know, n not a live poor person spent years in this situation. 
uh, in your experience, have you had problems with families not agreeing with whatever decisions were made by theologians or doctors or other, or, or other uh, hospital uh, people? Well, in my clinical experience, I would say I, I tend to be very supportive of, of families, and I think these are tough choices. We're often in a very difficult situation where there is no clear right and wrong. Uh, we often find ourselves in not a perfectionistic ethics sort of situation, but a realistic ethics and, yes. and having to make prudential decisions. So. Um, uh, I, I tend to be very supportive of the families and, and, and their decisions. The cases we looked at included a couple, one in which the family uh, wanted to um, uh, do uh, heroic means to go to uh, extreme or heroic means to keep the patient alive and uh, uh, the doctors were unwilling to do that, which is uh, a little unusual situation. And, uh, and these uh, doctors were at what hospital and, well, and of what religion? <laughs> oh, it wasn't religious. There was not a religious aspect right. to it, but uh, it was at a, at a secular uh, hospital in Louisiana, okay. uh, 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 which, of course, ended up in court. And then the other case involved a situation in which the family kind of one that cut the other way, the family wanted the patient who was essentially in a palliative care situation to, uh, they had been kind of convinced by the medical staff to allow an organ donation, a, a non-essential organ donation, and uh, uh, because of thinking, okay, well at least this person can, even though this person's not going to live, having to be a younger person, uh, uh, they could live on in some way in helping another person. But the medical staff refused to do that because they said, I'm, my responsibility is this patient, and though it's not necessarily a life-threatening thing, it certainly doesn't aid in their health, and so they refused to do the, oh, the organ uh, transplant. So those were Again, those are very difficult situations when, when there's not an obvious correct right. answer. No, uh, I had a very, very good friend, a woman who was seriously ill and she had been in the hospital and sent back home and then they would find her lying in the yard and back to the hospital. So she was at Mercy Hospital with a Catholic doctor and she was dying and she knew she was dying. Her sister talked to the doctor and said, could you stop all of the medication except the ones to re relieve pain? And he said, I couldn't do that, that would be murder. Now, you had a, you had a, a, a Catholic priest uh, or, or I don't know whether your doctors there were Catholics, but is that a common is that a common position? I would say it's not a common position. I think um, what you're really talking there about in the bioethics sphere is uh, doctors' paternalism versus patient autonomy, and that gets engaged in almost every medical decision. It, the doctor as the expert, to what extent, and of course they're supposed to be acting off of the Hippocratic Oath and always doing good and so do forth. Do no harm, yes. And, and so um, uh, that's one side of the equation. The other is patient autonomy. I would say in our current medical environment, well there's, there, there's one other force right now and that is the who pays question. And, and yes. uh, uh, increasingly medical decisions and even uh, doctor's decisions are made, they're forced almost to be made um, based on money. How many days can I stay in the hospital with what they call DRGs, diagnostic, diagnostic related groups? For everything, there's, a, there's an amount of time. 
and the person can stay that amount of days and then the hospital's doing it for free because the health care provider, be it government or an insurance company, will only pay for so many days. And the doctor may have to do it for free. Well, the doctor <laughs> may do it for free and also the hospital, he could lose, he or she could lose their privileges at that hospital if they keep losing money. Well, so. in that respect, in the case I just told you about where the doctor would not do what her sister wanted, they kept her there until all of her medical insurance ran out mm. and they sent her home and she died at home. That was when they decided to, to, to send her home when there was no more money coming That's, in. That I it, think is a tragedy and, and I'm I mean, I, I am fearful. I mean, this is already a problem. I, I am fearful with, with you know, going to a nationalized health care system that we may have, and I'm, I mean, I think we all would agree that what we have right now is not good, and we, we need a well, fix for our people are left healthcare. out, yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, I'm worried that this is going to be even taken to a higher level, that decisions are made based on age, and money and not on what is the best interest of the patient. Right. But having said all that, I would say that my experience in hospitals is that a, a, a very high degree of respect is given for patient autonomy and the decision of the family and it's rare for the medical staff to, to go against that. So, But when you say patient autonomy, they have to be competent to make right. their, to make decisions. Right, and that's a big and very issue. often in these cases where ethics come, becomes involved, the patient may not be in a position to make his or her own decision. Now, I presume all of you support the document that's you know the document that you sign that says I don't want any heroic efforts. Right. Uh, that the, do all doctors and hospitals accept that? Oh yes, and of course there was a, a law some time back that uh, hospitals had to go to patients and and uh, encourage them to write a, an advanced directive, and and that's pretty common in practice now. I, I will say that is sometimes more easily done in theory than in practice. I was afraid of that, yes. Let, let me just give you a case in point. I was trying to help a man at, 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 as a chaplain. Uh, it was a man who had cancer and it, as such was terminally ill but not immediately so. He was going to year, he, he could live for uh, you know year or several years and and be um, you know be able not not in some sort of palliative care situation but but have a an active life. But he could only do so if he had a surgery immediately. He had an immediate thing that had to be fixed. So how do you write that? Do you Because the standard thing you would write is a DNR order, do not resuscitate. Mm -hmm. And and yet for him to have the surgery, he was going to have to to have a ventilator on and yeah. and and uh, be resuscitated. So, how do you write that in a way that allows for uh, uh, some sort of um, some variability uh, as opposed to a straight thing? My recommendation to people in writing advance directives is to write a, some general guidelines and expressions of this is what my desire is, mm -hmm. but also allow a um, a surrogate decision maker, a family member, a friend, yes. who, to to make decisions in cases where. Um, a new technology has arisen, a new situation, a unique situation, and and can make maybe a more prudent decision than anybody could have foreseen. Yes, well, that's a health care power of attorney, which I right, en right. encourage everyone to, to have, right. and to give it to someone who isn't going to break down and soften up and say, oh, no, I can't make that decision. you got to give it to someone who will remain um, logical about right. about what decisions And certainly to somebody make. who cares about the person and doesn't have simply an economic interest in uh, oh, that person not, oh, a absolutely. not continue to live. Now let me let me bring up another matter because I'm a great supporter of death with dignity and a supporter of organizations which which propound that. 
there are a couple of states in the United States that now has made it legal for physicians to assist in dignified dying if the, if the patient uh, uh, has less than six months to live. A couple of states allow that. Other than that, it's illegal. Uh, now the death with dignity people, at least the, the, uh, the uh, uh, final exit network people, uh, if, you, if you have doctors saying you have less than six months to live, they will not assist you to die, but they will instruct you as to what you can do and even provide someone to be present but not to assist. How does that fit into ethics? Well, it certainly fits into the real world, doesn't it? I mean, there are people who get into this situation all the time, and um, it's, a, it's a very tough decision for families. Um, uh, I, I think the, the part of that, that that I think is probably has almost universal agreement is hospice care, that, that if somebody can come to a certain point and, and, you know, by definition, to go into hospice care, you're saying, I'm not going to continue uh, any kind of medical treatments. We're only going to, as you mentioned with your friend, just to, to give uh, some sort of, um, that we can make it where they have no pain. But, yes, but, but we're, we're not going to do anything proactively that's, that's going to prolong their life. But that could be far from death with dignity. It could be an ugly, long-term, you know, uh, painful, or maybe the patient won't even know who he is. Yeah. It, it, it would be less than dying with dignity to have a slow death in, in, in hospice care. Uh, so what what is the uh, the ethical position regarding someone uh, ending their own life by choice? Well, I think you and I will probably disagree on this. We might. But, but, I expected uh, we would. Um, I mean, I'm coming from a Judeo-Christian perspective that places a very high value on human beings and human life and is very reluctant to uh, do anything that would cheapen life. I mean, you give the example of, well, six months. Yep. Any physician will tell you they can't tell you with any precision uh, amount of time. They can yeah. make an estimate. It could be three or eight, but, I mean, they know that you're terminal. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I mean, I, I have... But, uh, but from a religious point of view... Uh, is suicide a sin? Or are you going to go to hell if you kill yourself? Um, there are some <laughs> religious traditions that believe that uh, uh, suicide can be a real problem. Uh, uh, in my tradition, suicide is, is, yes, it is a sin because of the taking of the life, but it, it, is not, uh, it would not send you to hell just because it's just a, another way that we might fall short of of uh, moral perfection. All right. Well, there was a recent article in the paper called, this was in uh, November of this year, Confronting Suicide. And it says here, nationwide, suicide is the third leading cause of death for people between the ages of 15 and 24. The third leading cause of death. That's a lot of people who are, who have decided that their life was no longer of any value. And, that, and that's what uh, one of the things that would give me pause about giving kind of a green light to anybody that wanted to uh, end their life um, because I think we all get in situations that uh, some more than others that we get depressed, we have unusual circumstances and, uh, I, and uh, I think it would be very easy for a line to be crossed. You said the situation of six months to death. Um, I know of a case in which a person went to Dr. Kevorkian's clinic, uh -huh. and uh, this was a person who famously lived in Texas, a long way away, but famously was, uh, I mean, among their, her own family was a person who was depressed, 
and a person who was a hypochondriac. Uh, and and she emotionally thought that she was terminal and so forth and, and just had a terrible life. Was she of uh, right sane mind? I mean, being a hypochondriac doesn't mean you're crazy. Right, right. I but mean, she I, was of sane, sound it, mind? It is considered a mental disorder, but I would, but she would be considered sane, yes. Okay. And, and she went to Kevorkian, and he assisted in her suicide. Okay. And the family was stunned because she was not terminally ill. I understand. And, and so uh, there are people, I was involved in an ethics case, and I have to generalize to protect uh, uh, individual uh, privacy, but there was a young man who through a tragic accident involving um, uh, Russian roulette uh, was left a quadriplegic and yet he was, uh, he was conscious, he was uh, able to communicate, and uh, in fact, it was because he was conscious and able to communicate that he expressed his desire to be withdrawn from the ventilator. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was an interesting discussion. The psychologist said, well, he's mentally alert enough that he can make a decision. The nursing staff said, no, he's too depressed. As a young man who's totally lost this life that he had before him, uh, this lifestyle, um, and uh, the, the assistant district attorney said you'd be crazy to do that without making the family do a writ because they could come back later and said, you know, he really could have had a fairly full and meaningful life. There was nothing that was life-threatening. Right. It was just he had a, a very sad and tragic situation and it's certainly a life that none of us would desire. Yes. But so it was, it was quality of life, not length of life, that was the issue. Okay. And so this is the line that I'm very concerned about crossing. The 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 line from somebody who's who's very immediately at the point of death, and we're talking about removing uh, suffering and so forth yes. from the person that just does so because of quality of life issues. Well, I, my position is that we as human beings. And of course, as a, as a secular humanist, uh, I, I have no concern about an afterlife. When I'm dead, as far as I'm concerned, it's all over. And I All the more to uh, give great pause to an irreversible uh, decision. The end, you know, the end <laughs> is the end. But I, it, my personal feeling is that if a person has any right at all as a human being, it's the right to decide when they want to go. I think that that is just a, a, a natural inborn right that if you are ready to end it, that's your decision. Why should anyone else be involved? What is what is the ethical uh, yeah, position Yeah, well, I, I would that? really disagree with that. I, I, I mean, just, that just the would. statistics that you cited, you were talking about teenagers. Teenagers who lose a girlfriend and they go out and shoot themselves. I mean, this is this is not they have rational. The right, I think they have the right to do that. Well, that you, there's two things. There, do you have a right to do it? Yeah, anybody can do that. What, who's who's going to stop you from doing it? Well, I don't. Except I, don't, I will say, yeah. as a as a counselor, we have the obligation. If anybody comes to us and says, "I'm going to go shoot myself." You are you are held according to the law to try to, to dissuade. Report, them. Well, actually, yeah. to report them and not, not let them out of your presence yes. until they're getting care. But um, uh, a person, anybody, can go kill themselves. I mean, there's, what's going right. to? But when I say them right, I wasn't talking about within the law or legal right. I'm saying, and I don't think our rights come from on high. You understand? As far as I'm concerned. We humans have, over the centuries, developed morals and ethics and standards, but they're human-made as far as I see it. And I think one of those human-made rights would be the right to decide when you've had enough. Now, I understand that that would not be a religious point of view. Well, just this week, I was having conversation with one of my doctors because 
apparently he had a little time and I had some time and he's been on my show and so I told him that you were going to be on my show and what the topic was and I said I understand that uh, suicide is considered a sin and you won't get to heaven and he said well not for Jews he said the Jewish religion doesn't even talk about heaven and hell which surprised me I'm a Jew but I was never a practicing Jew and he said we don't even you know in our religion there we, there's no heaven or hell so you can't be condemned to hell you know for for what some people would call a sin is that your understanding that uh, that the the main problem with suicide is a religious one I wouldn't frame it in the way you have. Uh, first of all, your friend is probably a Reformed Jew. If, if he were a conservative or Orthodox Jew, he would hold to an afterlife. Well, wait just one minute. Because when I questioned that, I said, well, the Old Testament, you know, the creation of everything, he went to his computer and he looked up Jews and afterlife and it said there was there was no position taken. Well, there's no universal position, but again, I mean, the, there's nothing in there's the Bible. There's three traditions well, uh, there, within uh, Judaism, and Orthodox Jews would 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 really uh, disagree okay. with you. Now, we've got, I would say that my faith tradition, the Southern Baptist faith tradition, does not consider suicide. It, we consider it to be a sin, it of falling short of of uh, uh, moral perfection, but we do not consider it to be something that that alone would send someone to hell. It, it's it's but you one sin among others. You don't say that the time of your death should be God's decision and not yours? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I even agree with God's decision. <laughs> I think God knows when we're going to die. I don't think He causes it. He, um, right. I, I think that, uh, uh, but I would say I think we ought to normally uh, allow natural causes to take their place. I think it's fine for a person to decide to, uh, who is terminally ill, and there's great evidence of that uh, in consultation with the family and, and the physicians to go the hospice route. Okay. Um, uh, I, I would always urge people to, uh, uh, to hold out. And, and I mean, I think we have to be careful because these decisions are not often made by people in a, in a position to make a good decision. One of the most famous cases in medical ethics is a guy in Texas who was in a car crash and it burned all over most of his body. And, and uh, he, was, he was given a series of things. He was saved. He begged people at the site to shoot him and they wouldn't do it. And, and so, it, but there was nothing that was life-threatening in that. It was just, it was life-changing. I see. Well, so, our time is up. I want, Dr. Lemke, I want to thank you very much for having this conversation with me. Thank you. I want to thank you folks for watching our show, and I hope we will see you again uh, often. <laughs>